All right, Crime Talk aficionados, we have a treat for you today. We have Justin Perpini with us today, and he has an interesting story. And I saw his interesting story on a TikTok, and so we reached out to him, and he was gracious enough to come and talk with us because I think it's an interesting story, and I think a lot of people can learn from this. So, Justin, why don't you give me kind of a quick bio of you, and then we'll talk about how you got involved with the FBI, so to speak. Thank you for the invitation. When I graduated USC in 1997, had aspirations to build a really successful career as a stockbroker in Century City. Many years in, things were going great. Several hundred million under management, a lot of clients, primarily uh, professional baseball players. I was a baseball player through college and executed trades for hedge fund managers. In time, I learned that a hedge fund manager client of ours was making misrepresentations to his investors to raise money. Rather than you know shut down the fraud, fire the client, we found a way at UBS to protect ourselves so we wouldn't be held culpable if this thing blew up, which it did. And we turned the other way in part because it was significant commissions every single month, $100,000 at least a month. So this fraud went on for a while. Then in December 2005, the whole thing imploded when investors in my client's hedge fund began reaching out to UBS, my employer, asking, you know, where is their money? Is this you know, legitimate? What's taking place? From there, an investigation began, started with the SEC, then the Department of Justice. I retained a lawyer. And like so many defendants do when they become immersed in the criminal justice system, rather than accept responsibility and own it, I doubled down and I made things measurably worse. And in the end, I ended up serving a federal prison sentence because of my continuous bad decisions. Wow. So, I mean, so that's interesting. Obviously, USC, great school. Mm-hmm. You're, you're a smart guy, kind of living the, the dream, so to speak, mm-hmm. right? You're, you got a great job, probably making really good income. And then all of a sudden, it sounds like you're almost complicit by not letting somebody know in compliance that, hey, this thing may be a complete fraud. So I'm pretty good friends with the FBI agent that arrested me, Paul Bertrand. After my release from prison, he invited me to the academy to speak. And the word he used when introducing introducing me to the new agents was enabled. He said, Justin wouldn't have perpetuated or created a fraud on his own, but he enabled this fraud to continue. And that's not unlike so many, so many people on the wrong side of prison boundaries. They didn't begin their career with aspirations to break the law, to hurt people, to go to prison. Yet when faced with pressure and temptation, rather than do the right thing, I gave in. I made bad decisions and in so doing created a whole lot of pain for people. So my background, so to speak, is not so different from so many people who serve time in these minimum security camps. Absolutely. So ultimately, the Department of Justice gets involved, FBI is there. What are you ultimately charged with and what do you go to court for? When the government, when the FBI showed up at my home, I retained a lawyer. I lied to the lawyer because I was afraid. I didn't want the lawyer to judge me negatively. I didn't want him to see me as a bad person. So when I met with my lawyer, I lied. When I interviewed with the FBI, I lied. I learned at the time that wasn't, I guess, perjury because I wasn't under oath, but I began to obstruct the investigation. Had I told the truth in that meeting with the FBI, it was very likely they never would have charged me. But doubling down, my post-defense conduct was tragic. So as a result of my conduct and then post-defense conduct, I was told I can go to, to trial and lose. Or David Willingham, the U.S. attorney at the time, said, I'll give your guy, he said this to my lawyer, I'll give him a deal. He can plead guilty to one count of conspiracy to commit securities fraud with a 60-month cap. And my lawyers told me, primarily because of my post-defense conduct did not owning it, that I could probably expect to get 48 to 60 months in prison. I really, I got 18 months, a few breaks, namely my co-defendant who was cooperating, got indicted on new charges. You shouldn't break the law again if you're cooperating. So I got a big break that enabled me to go from 60 months down to 18 months. And really the hardest part was the three and a half years it took from when the investigation started, from when I went to prison. The waiting, it was just brutal. It was 24 hours a day of anxiety. I was thrilled to get to prison to get started. No, I hear you. Well, so you bring up a couple of good points that we talk about here all the time. I've done criminal defense now for 27 years. And the general rule of thumb is, one, um, keep your mouth shut. But if you are going to talk, make sure you tell the truth because they will punish you 
uh, for for lying to the FBI. They will punish you for obstructing their investigation for sure, referring to the FBI or, or, or somebody else. And the other thing is the wheels of justice, particularly in the white collar world, move very slowly. So from the start of the investigation, the time you go off to prison three and a half years, I mean, that must have been just brutal, the anxiety of not knowing. Well, when you if you look at comments on our white collar advice YouTube channel or TikTok, people will dismiss the 18 months. And look, relatively speaking, it's not a long time. My business partner, Michael Santos, did 26 years in prison. So it is a cup of coffee, so to speak. But I tell people, I feel like I did the 18 months in prison plus the three and a half years before I went in. That was harder than any day in a minimum security camp. Uh, many clients have told me that the fear of the unknown is worse than knowing that you, okay, this is my sentence and this is where I'm ultimately going to go. <clears throat> So I, I hear you. I understand. I have clients that the waiting is the worst. What was the judge like? Um, you know, obviously, when you go to federal court, you've got the pre-sentence investigation report. You've looked at the calculations under the federal sentencing guidelines. Were they advisory? They were advisory by by your time, obviously. Yes. The, the losses at the time in the hedge fund was more than $9 million when I pled. So the guidelines, of course, were more than 10 years. By the time I pled guilty and I was sentenced, UBS and me paid all of the money back. So thankfully, all of everyone was repaid, though it doesn't replace the pain and agony they went through, to be clear, for everyone watching. Sure. So the guidelines you know, were 12 years. I had a cap of 60 months. Over the course of three years, while I made a lot of bad, I ate poorly. I put on weight. I was just I was depressed over that period of time. I did work. And the work, work is very important for a defendant because it helps them build a new record as a law-abiding citizen, shows that I'm not going to break the law. So work was crucial. Paying back the money was crucial. Some charity work was crucial. But I did have a very tough judge, Judge Stephen Wilson, and he was correct at my sentencing. And my mm -hmm. sentencing, the government asked for 24 months in prison. I was given 18 months in prison. But before I was sentenced, he said, you know, you had a lot of opportunities. You knew right from wrong. You went to a good school, wonderful parents who were in the courtroom, all true. And I'm tired of salesmen turning the other way for commissions. Most don't get caught. You did. You're going to go to prison. And I can't disagree with anything that he said. Now, in the 13 years that I've been a consultant or federal prison consultant or in the mitigation space, I've been back to the courtroom to watch my clients get sentenced in front of Judge Wilson. And I can see that, yes, he's a tough sentencing judge, but he will reward you if he feels you are making amends and you don't say sorry because you got caught. And rather than give him happy talk, you can actually lay out a plan for what it is you'll do with the rest of your life and not return to that courtroom. So I would argue that he was a judge that was fair and can be influenced both good and bad. Yeah. You said a couple of things that we always talk about when it comes to clients, particularly on financial crimes is, you know, one, you paid back the money. That's so important mm -hmm. in, in my humble opinion, because, uh, you know, we kind of joke here on the show quite a bit and say it's always about the money. And when they say it's not about the money, then, you know, it's really about the money. Yes. It, in a white collar case and a theft case, people want their money back. And the more that you can come up with before sentencing, legitimately, obviously, the better. It shows you're on that step, so to speak. And the second point is the fact that you said work, um, advising your clients to work. I tell clients all the time, they're like, well, what should I do? Should I just you know, go be a, a hermit in my house or should I go get a job? And I'm like, go get a job, continue to work, be a productive member of society because it's easier to send somebody to prison when they have nothing going for them. But if they've already started, you know, they've been working, they got a family, it's harder for that judge, no matter how easy the judge may seem like he wants to send somebody to prison, it's still hard. I've talked to a lot of judges, both state and federal, and they said the hardest part of their job is sending people to prison. It, you know, may look easy, but it's not. They struggle over it. Well, quick story in 20 seconds or less. The reason you're a good lawyer is because you give that advice to your clients. Three weeks ago, I got a call from a chiropractor in Arizona who his lawyer said, you cooperated so extensively. You're not going to go to prison because of it. Not to worry. The judge was upset he didn't make a payment towards his restitution. And the probation report shows he's leasing a Tesla. He's bought a huge home. He's still in the country club. And the judge is like, your cooperation is not going to keep you out of jail. You got victims here. All these things matter. Yep. And and at the and, and those type of cases, the judges, you know, th there's usually victims in the courtroom. And um, I had a federal sentencing 
uh, I guess it was, it was, I guess just right before COVID client had, uh, you know, stolen several millions of dollars and all the victims are in the back of the courtroom. And, you know, the judge would have given him more time if he could have, because these were family members, you know, there was no plan to get the money back. Not that we didn't, you know, we didn't broach that subject. I assure you, there was just no resources to do it uh, because they spent it all. But like you said, they look at the, like, well, you got, you, you went on this spending spree and he kind of continued to live large. Well, in the meantime, he's got victims. It's like, what do you expect to happen? That, that is sort of having the, like your cake and having your cake and eating it too. I'm sorry, but not really sorry. Cause I'm going to continue to spend. If the goal is really the shortest sentence in the most favorable institution, preferably your home, it's going to require you to make some decisions that are hard and potentially begin to live a lifestyle that is foreign to you if you have to give up things. And it's hard for some defendants because some people have enablers around them, kind of tell them what they want to hear. Don't yep. worry about it. Everything I, that happened to me. We're not going to send they're not going to send you to prison. No you way. didn't do anything wrong. And, you know, they didn't really know the, the facts. So people need to understand changes are coming. But in the end, if the goal is to protect themselves and their family and actually create a plan to repay the victims, it's going to require making really tough decisions. And judges value that authenticity, not just the talk. What is the plan and what is the follow through? We, we uh, here on the show, I have the uh, 12 undeniable truths of life from a criminal defense <laughs> attorney. And um, the number one is there's two types of people in the world, those that are humble and those that are about to be. And I let clients know that you are now in the criminal justice system. You need to be humble because it will humble you if you're not. Um, and that's exactly, I think, what you were you know, talking about. There are changes are coming. Well, I have a client. We did a YouTube video a few weeks ago on the, the White Collar Advice YouTube channel who basically said, I went from arrogant to humble the second I got that target letter. From the CFO of a billion-dollar company to delivering bread at 4 a.m. But the judge appreciated it. So it requires a change in and mindset and a willingness to embrace things that if you've had success, if you've made money, if you're educated, it may require you to do some things you've never done before, but it's frankly part of the journey. And while humbling, it does build character and it just sets the stage for the rebound. And I hate to sound Tony Robbins like, but that's what prison was like for me. I was able to overcome an adversity that I created. And that's what I'll say before I go to your next question. There is an otherness with white collar crime. If someone gets cancer, of course you have empathy for them. They didn't choose it. But with white collar crime, I brought this on myself. I did this. I knew that it was wrong. I knowingly broke the law. So I have to work even harder to demonstrate why I'm truly sorry and why I'm worthy of a second chance. And if I can do it, I assure you any, can, any defendant can do it, but it really requires hard work. Absolutely. Um, so you get sentenced. Were you allowed to uh, self-surrender or did you get remanded that day? Thankfully, Judge Wilson allowed me to self-surrender. was sentenced February 2008 and I self-surrendered to the minimum security camp in Taft, California on April 28, 2008. Okay. Now, this is I'm going to ask you this question um, sure. because I always tell clients, you know, oh, they're not going to impose a fine. Don't worry about it. You know, restitution, you'll take care of it when you get out. But that $100 special assessment fee, <laughs> they're coming for it, aren't they? <laughs> they're, they're coming for it and it should be paid and you should surrender with it and, and bring the receipt. And also, if you owe restitution to those of you who may be in prison, the FRP, while voluntary, if you choose not to pay it, they can voluntarily move you where you move your bunk voluntarily choose not to give you as much halfway house time. So make sure you make your FRP payments in federal prison and maybe 25 or 50 bucks a quarter, make the payments, pay, pay something. Yes. Uh, regularity. I've told, I don't care if it's 10 bucks, but yes. pay them every month. If you can pay 20 yes. bucks, pay them and only 10 the next, but it shows that you're making a good faith effort towards that. So great advice. And like I said, I always tell the clients, it doesn't matter. You can own millions of dollars. That $100 special assessment fee, they're coming for it. <laughs> they're going to get it from you as quickly as possible. I don't know why uh, that is that is the uh, thing they're looking for. It kind of cracks me up. So That's right. So you go to BOP. Um, it's minimum security. So you're not down here at you know the Supermax down in uh, Florence, Colorado or anything. That would have really killed the mother, please. That, that, <laughs> would, that, would have, that would have truly put her into a trance. Thankfully, it was the minimum security camp. But still, it's prison. 
Yeah. Tell me what that was like going into something, you know, a guy that's, you know, had a pretty good life, you know, good upbringing, had it all kind of there. And all of a sudden to be stripped of everything. What was that like? Well, because I did a poor job of, of planning and I had seen so many things sensationalized on television, Shawshank and Cool Hand Luke, I presumed it would be that way. Yet when I went from the low security prison where I was processed to the camp, I was surprised at how how open it was. There was no fences or, or barbed wire. I was surprised surprised at how self directed it really was. It's like go find your way to laundry, go find your way to the dorm. I was surprised at how many guys were were helpful, smiling, happy, productive. I immediately see, saw opportunities uh, to grow, but I knew right within a few days or so that what I did in the early days and weeks of my imprisonment would define the whole my whole time. In other words, if I slept in, if I was lazy, if I watched TV all day, if I complained in the chow hall, blamed others for my plight in life, that would have been my whole journey. So I immediately began to associate with people like Michael Santos, my now partner who was serving a 45 year sentence, who was productive, who was educating people, who was preparing for a law abiding life after prison. So once I focused on what I could and could not control, like maybe couldn't control my bunkie or my job, or if they chose to do cold water in the showers or I mean, who cares that it takes them nine times to do the standing count in the totality of our life? Who cares if I walk into the shower and it's filthy with crazy and gross things? Who cares? Soon will this be over? Am I ready for life on the other side? So in those early days, with the help of mentors like Michael, I became obsessed, I'm like 24 hours a day consumed with this measly 18 month sentence in a minimum security camp cannot will not define the rest of my life. And I'm not going to encumber my family or my parents any further. So I saw room for, for growth, but it really stems from the right attitude, but also avoiding problems. As you know, there's iPhones in prison, there's drugs, there's drones dropping food out onto the yard, cigarettes at 10 bucks a pop. So everyone wants to do great things in prison, but you can't do great things if you're associating with the wrong people, engaging in the hustle and getting caught. And hardly a week goes by without our team getting a call from someone saying, oh, my God, my husband got caught with an iPhone or my husband got caught with this. What happens now? He's in the hole. And as you may know, getting caught with an iPhone now isn't just a disciplinary infraction. Prisoners are getting new charges. So everything that I wanted to do started with I can't make matters worse. And then you can grow inside of this camp. Oh, that's 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 really good advice. You have people have to go do their time, don't associate with the wrong crowds. Although if you go to some of the more um, yes. high risk prisons, sometimes you don't really have a choice uh, is my understanding when it comes to who you're going to associate with uh, in there. So, uh, but it's still good advice. You got to keep your nose clean while you're there. And were you able to take advantage of any, I mean, you obviously were educated, uh, but was there any kind of educational programs or skills that you could take participate in while you were there? Most of the programming for me was self-directed, though my business partner, Michael Santos, taught this incredible entrepreneurial class that really helps people focus on communication, growing your network, your education, reading with a purpose. You know, he encouraged me, for example, write your probation officer from prison. Why? Lay out your plans upon your release. So when I met my probation officer, Mr. Murrow in the halfway house, he said, I'm impressed with what you're trying to do. And I'm impressed that you took the time to write me. And I'm going to give you a window to try to make this business of yours, which was speaking on ethics and working as a mitigation and prison consultant. I'm going to give you a window. I'm not sure anyone's ever going to pay you or hire you, he told me, <laughs> you know, but because of your efforts, I'm going to give you an opportunity to make that happen. And that all stemmed from Michael conveying to me, hey, you can do what some guys do here, which is play table games for 14 hours a day, walk the track for 12 hours a day. And you can watch a whole lot of Kardashians in here if you like. But you got a whole lot of problems waiting for you on the other side. So it was Michael that compelled me to work. And we I know you may get into the founding of White Collar Advice. It was Michael and me together in a quiet room in federal prison assessing how can we help more people coming into this really wretched system. Wow. Yeah, let, let, let's do. I definitely want to get into that. But so you're in BOP. How much time did you actually serve? Did you do the 85 percent until you went to a halfway house? Yes, my sentence was 18 months right after I, I went to prison. The Second Chance Act that President Bush signed in 2008 was implemented. So I typically would have gotten 45 days in the halfway house. They were just doubling it at the time to 90 days. So on an 18 month sentence, good time took me to 15 months and 21 days, 90 days in the halfway house. I served like 388 days in prison. 
And it was on um, May 20th, 2009, I went from prison to the halfway house in Hollywood. I was in the halfway house for six weeks, home confinement for six weeks. And I was done August of nine, then three years of probation, completed August of 12. Wow. So you did the whole, the whole thing. That's for sure. <laughs> well, I knew Judge Wilson. You know, some defendants really want to try to get off probation early for a number of reasons. I never wanted to see Judge Wilson again. <laughs> So I did not want to go back in front to request time off, especially because I was now in the prison space. Not everyone loves the, what we do. They, you know, trying to help people in trouble, get the shortest sentence, have a productive experience through prison. So not everyone loves what we do. And Judge Wilson didn't love what I was doing once he learned what I was doing. So I figured it was better just to lay low and serve the three years on probation. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, um, you know, probation or, or, you know, supervised release um, as it's called, if you get one of those violations, you know, you go back in front of the judge and then they look at the violation level. And, you know, I've had federal judges say, you know, I can send, we'll keep doing this till we get it right. So I'm going to send back <laughs> for another, you know, 60, 180 days. And, you know, like I hope if you come back, I hope you have a plan. You know, I've had judges tell me, what is your plan when you get out? And I had a client once who I walked on two homicide cases. We're back in front of my gun case. And he's like, what's your plan? I told my clients, you better have a plan. Better have a plan. And the judge asked him a sentencing because I know this judge. And uh, he goes, what's your plan? And he goes, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll move out of state to my sister's house or something. <laughs> goes, that ain't a plan. <laughs> well, I saw Judge Wilson once. So I'm, I'm this, I don't sell this book. So in prison with Michael, I wrote a book called Lessons from Prison. The book is free. Nobody should buy it. Nobody should buy the book. But my probation officer was concerned at my spending because when I came home, I didn't have any money. So yeah. I was print. I self-published the book. I was publishing. I was paying for this book on my city card at like 25% interest. So on probation, you fill out these monthly probation reports. And he's like, what is this $6,500 charge to city card? And I said, I need to print my books. I need to distribute them. He said, Judge Wilson's not going to be happy. I said, let's not tell Judge Wilson. I already did. We have a hearing next week. I'm like, oh, he's going to send me back to prison for spending. Instead, Judge Wilson said, anytime you need to spend more than $500, your probation officer approves that you are spending too much money. And that was the last time I printed a copy of my books for about 18 months. I understand because yeah, people don't realize when you're on... You know, you, you go and meet your probation officer for your supervised release time that that, is, you know, they own you. And it's like you said, it's you're still under the supervision of the courts and the Bureau of Prisons, et cetera. And, uh, yeah, you got to ask permission for things, even though you're out of custody. You're still asking for permission for things. And, like and, that. And they're always watching. Two years ago, a dentist from Vegas serving who served six months for tax fraud was turned in by a business partner because he held on to his handgun and the probation officer learned that's not a violation. That's a new charge. Fell in a possession of a firearm. I mean, you've got to make better decisions or else they're going to throw you right back into this wretched system. Yep. That's true. So when you, when you got released, um, you were obviously working on, on a book. Uh, tell me how all that came about and how you got uh, uh, white collar advice started. So when I surrendered to prison, I shook hands with my now business partner, Michael Santos, who had been in for 22 years. And he's a prolific author, got an undergraduate and master's degree in prison, wrote a very famous book called Inside Life Behind Bars in America. He started in the penitentiary, worked his way down to the camp, and he began to mentor me. And for a while, I kind of ignored it, like, hey, I'm going to be fine. I'm educated. When I come home, friends will hire me. And then I began to see guys scared to go home, like, what, oh, my God, what, what awaits me on the other side? Mm -hmm. So Michael encouraged me to begin documenting the journey. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? He's like, share it with the world. You're in prison. You have lessons to offer. So with Michael's suggestions, suggesting, we began documenting my journey by way of a daily blog at justinpaperni.com. And within weeks, we're getting 30, 40 letters a week in prison from people like reading the blog, just thanking me for providing a glimpse into this world of imprisonment. And based on that feedback and also prison, people were surrendering, seeking us out. Hey guys, thank you for the blog. This is incredible. My wife isn't scared anymore. My kids are going to hold me accountable. I'm just not going to waste this time. So the blog was really the harbinger for lessons from prison that Michael and I wrote together. And lessons from prison documents my journey from an educated student athlete to the world of money management, to making bad decisions, ending up in, in federal prison and trying to create a guide or roadmap for people who now find themselves immersed in this system and letting them know there's a path to get through it, but not through happy talk, 
but by work. So the book was written and published. I received a copy of it a week before I was released. So Michael and I together, I worked, he's my mentor. I worked alongside him 18 hours a day in federal prison to work to create this business that could someday influence people who are going to come into the system. And we've always done it in a way where it's not boilerplate, stuff that you can get for free on our YouTube channel. How do you shop in the commissary, getting the best job? There's value there, but you don't pay for that. The question is, if you've got 18 months, three years, four years, five years, what do you do to ensure this isn't a life sentence? How do you grow your network? How do you get funded again? How do you tell a woman on the other side of prison, I just got out of prison? How do you prove worthy of higher levels of liberty while on probation, like many of our clients can travel, including outside the country? So as Michael liked to say, let's just stare at this blank wall and create something together and work incredibly hard to help people going through struggle because they're just like us. They never imagined in a million years they would end up here. So it started inside of a, a prison uh, quiet room. Michael still had four years left to serve after I was released, and I was not initially allowed to converse with him when I left. So we did a lot through kind of correspondence and friends and whatnot. But we built this business together starting in, uh, in 2008. And when he came home in 2013, we've been doing it together um, ever since. I really run the consulting, the white collar advice. And Michael runs our nonprofit, Prison Professors, which creates and distributes content to hundreds of thousands of people in prisons and jails across the country. Earlier, you mentioned, you know, some people may go to a prison where they don't have the choice. Michael was in the penitentiary for eight years. So he has that level of authenticity with prisoners and higher security prisons. So he'll create content that in California, every California prison uses content that he creates. So we each have our role but we're very much a team and we have a very large team uh, working with, you know, clients all throughout the country. Well, that's, that's, that's great. I mean, that's quite a success story because I think you mentioned it earlier that, you know, when you get in trouble and you go to court and your world's upside down, so many people want to, you know, run around and say, Oh, you know, I'm, this is me. It defines me from here on out. Mm -hmm. And now it's a little, you know, it's part of the story, so to speak, but it isn't you. You didn't get up and say, hi, I'm, I'm Justin, uh, you know, the, the felon who, who did these terrible things. You don't want to hire me, do you? You know, you went out there and said, how can I help people and use my life experience to help other people hopefully avoid this or make the process a little easier if they have, you know. I, I would agree with that there you have, I think to be successful as a felon, you've got to be authentic. I served a year in a minimum security camp. Michael was in 27 prisons, Larry Hartman, Sam Mangel, other people on our team have experiences that anybody can learn from. When I met Michael in prison, I said, I've got to get a new job. I got to rebuild my reputation. I got to get in better shape. I got to pay all this, this money back. Like, I, I don't even know where to start. Like, it's just too much. It's too overwhelming. He helped me understand slow and steady wins the race, the daily incremental pursuit of goals. So he said, what's the next thing that you can do? You need to understand your story, Justin. Why did a privileged kid from Encino, who was a student athlete at USC, go rogue and break the law and hurt people? You can't do anything until you understand how you ended up here. Yep. Wow, that would, I get chills now even thinking about it. So for anyone who's going through this, if you're a felon, if you're going to prison, if you're, if you're home from prison, if you are unable to articulate clearly how and why you went rogue and broke the law and what you've learned from it, you're always going to struggle and run from it because people will default to he's a felon. You got nothing coming or they're going to do some people just say, presume I'm, I'm Bernie Madoff. I'm, I'm, I'm a perpetual criminal. You don't need to sway everyone, but you do need to begin to get people back in your corner. And it really starts with communication skills and being able to tell your story in a way that people get. That's what I try to do in that TikTok video that went viral. When obviously when everything comes down, I oftentimes tell clients, you truly find out who your friends are. You know, you have a lot of acquaintances like, oh, they wish you luck. Uh, but none of them usually show up from court or want to, you know, write that letter that, you know, goes to the judge that says, wow, certainly don't condone what went on here, but I know, you know, uh, Justin and, and, you know, this is out of character. It's an aberration and, uh, you know, we're here for him type of thing. Did you have that experience as well? Did you find out a lot of people, uh, didn't want to associate with you in any way? Yes. There are some people who take pleasure in, in your pain, especially if they feel you were at a point, uh, you were having success in your life, maybe to their detriment or they were jealous. There's a lot of envy in this world. Yeah. So there was an email that circulated before I went to prison where people making some jokes about, you know, rape and things like that, kind of a 
So there are some people that I thought would stand alongside me who took some pleasure in my pain, so to speak. Maybe I brought some of that on. I'm not really sure. But I chose to focus on those who were coming in into my network, people that were choosing to stand alongside me. My best friend, Brad Fulmer, who played in the big leagues for nine years, got a World Series ring with the Angels, went to my sentencing, went to my guilty plea, visited me twice a month in in federal prison. And you begin to get notes from old friends like Gabe Kapler, who's been in the news lately. He's the manager of the San Francisco Giants I grew up playing baseball with. You know, out of the blue, I get a call from Gabe. He's like, hey, let's go for let's go for a run together and let's just talk. And ever since then, he's been in, in my network, all as a result of my conviction. And we hadn't spoken for a, for more than a decade. So I didn't want to fixate on those who ran from me. I wanted to prove worthy of those who were uh, standing alongside me. And I'm continuing to nurture relationships. Wow. Well, I mean, that's, that's great. And obviously you, um, learn from this experience and never went back or you know, did anything that would put you, uh, have your Liberty, uh, put in jeopardy again. So if someone's looking at, you know, they're, they've, they've, uh, got themselves in trouble, how do they find you? What can you do for them as a consultant? So I'd encourage anyone to to go to whitecollaradvice.com. Lessons from Prison is free. Uh, another book our team wrote called Prepare, How to Manage a Government Investigation. All 27 chapters are on there for free. Hundreds and hundreds of videos on our White Collar Advice YouTube channel. We give away tons and tons of, of, of content, and it's not boilerplate. It's helping you understand how you, through your own words, can demonstrate why you're worthy of leniency. And that's what I think our team does to your question of what we do. Judge, we interviewed Judge Boo and Judge Bennett on our YouTube channel. And they essentially said, if you broke my window, don't say I'm sorry. What's your plan to fix my window? And what is your plan to never return to our courtroom? So we want to help defendants in their own words convey that message. So we encourage everyone to go through our free resources. If they'd like to speak with us, they can certainly schedule a call at whitecolloradvice.com. And I can assure you at the end of that call, whether our team works with you or not, that you'll be further ahead because you'll be on your way to having a plan. But I will say it does require work. Everybody wants it, but it can be difficult on days to prepare when you feel like your life is imploding. So I would say to you what Michael said to me in prison, what's the next right thing? What's the ne What can you do in the next 10 minutes? F forget about five years or three years or 10 years or 50 years and reverse engineering your way back. What can you do in the next 15 minutes? And maybe that's getting lessons from prison and reading chapter two, the fraud triangle which may help you understand the pressures you felt, how you rationalize them and the opportunities you seized. What's the next right thing for you to do? Our team would love to help whether you hire us or you just go through our free resources. No, that's great. And what I really like about it, and I've had clients that have worked with consultants in mm -hmm. the past as, as well, kind of a, as a team effort. And um, what I like what you're saying is, is there has to be authenticity to the words because you got to remember that United States District Court judge, they've usually been around the block, right? Even if they didn't start out as a prosecutor or something, they've been there. They've kind of heard it before and they've heard the, I'd like to apologize to the court. I'd like to apologize to the community. I'd like to apologize to my victims. Oftentimes it's just words, you yes. know, the attorneys, we always try to, you know, it's, it's trust, but verify. So <laughs> You say you're sorry, but what have you done to, like you said, try to make it right? You broke the window. Did you fix the window? What are you going to do to make sure you're not coming back here again, other than maybe to serve on jury duty or something along those lines? That's that right. what judges really want, not the, hey, I'm really sorry I got caught. It doesn't work. Th that I, I tried, I create some YouTube videos from sentencing hearings. And recently I did one where my client's co defendant spoke first. And when he opened up, it was all about himself and his family and how tough this has been, all true. But that's the wrong message. Defendants need to understand the stakeholders. How hard does this judge work to become a judge? Probably pretty hard. You too should be demonstrating how hard you are working. And when you speak or when you write or create a video, whatever it may be, focus on the victims if they've been created. You can't just focus on how your own life is imploding. Because as you said earlier, there could be victims in the courtroom who are like, Hello, you stole from me. I'm hurt. My retirement's in the toilet. I'm sorry that you're hurt. What about me? That's what judges are thinking. And one other point I want to make, because you addressed it earlier, if you had a, have, if you've had opportunity, if you've been successful, if you've had money or privilege, things that we often hear about, 
it's okay to own it and to talk about it and to mention that you did have opportunities and breaks that many people in that courtroom did not have. I did that. And I think the judge appreciated it because it's, because it's true. Don't try to be someone that you're not. And if you have to share some embarrassing and awful things, at least you will be authentic. But I actually do think it advances your agenda. I, I totally agree. Good advice. Good advice. Well, like I said, I, I saw you, Justin, on uh, TikTok, and I'm like, wow, this is interesting. I wound up watching all of your TikToks. And then I was literally like, Julie, we need to get this guy on the show. This is, you know, this is good advice. And there were so many things that I have said over the years, you know, how it's like you can tell your kids good advice, but the next door neighbor says it and it just makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. So I thought, let's have Justin on. And some of the things that I've said over the years, maybe people say, yeah, it's not just Scott saying this stuff. It matters. You know, the, the empathy, uh, the sympathy for, uh, you know, particularly in white collar cases, people don't realize it, how impactful uh, white collar uh, offenses can be oftentimes on the victim. Because like you said, they've lost their 401k, you know, maybe their retirement is no more. They have to go back to work. And if they're not, particularly in your case, it sounds like, they were made whole again. But if they're not, you know, those judges got to look at those victims sitting there saying, I've lost my entire life savings and now I got to go get a job as a greeter at Walmart. That's impactful on those judges as well. So if you can't make them whole, you have to be very empathetic to the circumstances. And even if they've been paid back, they may never get their dignity back. And it's part of the reason defendants shouldn't compare their losses to other, to other cases. I, I've known of defendants who stole, you know, a million dollars and got 10 years because the person they stole from were, were, were elderly people. And I've known people on $40 million frauds get six months in prison because the victim's a bank or an insurance company, still victims. So it's just, I used to do a lot of that. Like, what is this co case compared to mine? And it's the same prosecutor and judge. And he got this, I'll got that. Every case is different. Mitigation is different. And I'd encourage people to, to not get lost on Google searching for information that may not apply to them. Make sure you are getting the right information and confirming that it's accurate. That is that is such good advice. Every case is different. Um, you can, you know, how many cases you handle at the end of the day, they're all different. You have a different defendant who's got a different story, uh, different victims, different judge, different prosecutors. Each case is different and you can't say, oh, I've done this case a million times and this is the way it's probably all going to turn out. Oh, you got nothing to worry about. <laughs> and that client goes out the door into the magic door, you know, yeah. in the courtroom there and he's looking at you like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, each case is different. So, hey, Justin, thank you so much for coming on. I, you know, I really uh, believe this is good stuff to hear. Uh, and, you know, the fact that you're telling people, you got to own this stuff because, you know, when the feds show up, you know, 98% of federal cases wind up in guilty pleas. And those that go to trial, another 98% wind up in guilty pleas. So at some point, you're going to have to start talking about mitigation and guilty pleas. And that starts early and it starts often in a case. And you have to be prepared, not only whether it's to the district attorney, or the United States attorney for mitigation, maybe to get a few points off here and there on the sentencing guidelines or maybe a different charge. Uh, it, it matters. And so I think it's, it's good advice uh, because oftentimes, you know, sometimes as attorneys, we lose sight of um, being able to slow down sometimes and, and give that advice. So it sounds like you guys are doing very, very good work. And I'm grateful for the invitation. Look forward to, to continuing our, our conversations. And the last thing I'll say to everyone watching, if you're in trouble, the first thing you have to do is speak openly and honestly with your lawyer. They are not there to judge you. The more they know, the better. If you're thinking if you should say it, say it, I beg you. That's the only way they can help get you the best outcome. Yep. And it's so, I know sometimes it's like you said, it's embarrassing. But like I said, I've been doing this for 27 years. There's probably nothing you could tell me that's gonna embarrass nothing. me. Nothing, nothing. And it's going to be like, okay. And I tell my clients, listen, if we go to court and um, there's something you could have told me that could have avoided an embarrassing situation, you know, I may get my trousers figuratively pulled down around my ankles and I look really silly, but you're going to prison. So <laughs> if there's something I can avoid or we can't avoid it, we need to deal with it. But I can't do that without the truth. And yeah. sometimes people, uh, they lie to their attorney just because they, they want to, um, 
they don't want to embar be embarrassed or they want to tell their family members because you know they've told them a different story than what they may tell the attorney and then it's awkward and it's just but the attorney has to know the truth i last thing i'll say i've told people you should be a part of a, a book i'd like to write called how to flush money down the toilet because you gave two hundred thousand dollars to a lawyer still doesn't know the truth you're spinning tails you're not helping you're not helping anyone and uh i come across it too much is just tell the truth. That's the only way you can get the best possible outcome and begin the healing. Listen, in litigation, the truth or a pretty darn close version of it is going to come out. So Always. Just, let's, let's just cut to it. Uh, so, all right. Uh, thank you, Justin Perpini of White Collar Defense. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation.